three biggest fears of almost every Submariner is a seawater leak, a fire, and a steam line rupture. What goes into operating a submarine? You're talking about high schoolers operating these incredibly complex systems and machinery. Uh, we're talking warheads. How do you deal with boredom? Think of it like the guards at Buckingham Palace. When they're standing guard, they are not allowed to do anything else besides that one job. You're not sending movies back and forth. Netflix. There's no Netflix underwater. <laughs> and what are the things that could go wrong? But when you're in an area where there is nowhere for you to get that smoke out, if there is a fire, it just fills up instantly. You'll die generally from the smoke inhalation before you will of the fire or the heat. And in a fire situation, how much time do you have to rise to the surface? We actually had a fire happen a couple times in the dryer because... Here's a potentially dumb question. Are there any windows in a submarine? Nope, there are definitely no windows in a submarine. <laughs> the only the yellow submarine in Atlantis and Disneyland have those. Do you miss being on a submarine now that you have moved on to more corporate America lifestyle? When you have that level of responsibility and the necessity to see the mission through and you succeed, everything else is almost child's play. Where do you think corporate America could learn from the military? Structure and systems are you know, ingrained in both. The problem, and I'm really surprised to see this because I've worked with a lot of really big companies is that. In today's episode, we're talking to Jeff, a Navy submariner turned venture capitalist who has helped his clients raise over $1 billion. We'll delve into what entrepreneurs can learn from the military and what life is like on a nuclear powered submarine. Stick till the end to learn the top things you need to do to raise capital and scale a company to eight figures. How specifically do you help entrepreneurs? Well, it, it ranges in a lot of different ways. I've worked with a number of startups, early stage companies that are looking to raise capital and get going all the way up to companies doing in the billions. Um, and so I've helped companies along that entire spectrum in a number of different ways. My main skill set is really the systems that create scale and helping companies navigate those waters so they can get to that point. Can you give us an example? You mentioned some companies don't even know how they can scale. Do they struggle with it? Is that what you said? They don't know how to systemize certain things, right? And so um, this entire book, All Hands on Deck, was really written to focus on that, which was, you know, as you know, I was in the U.S. Navy, I was on a submarine. So I wrote a book called All Hands on Deck, how U.S. Navy submariners structure, systemize and optimize for success. And the reason I wrote that book was because when I was when I got out of the Navy, my very first job was actually a boiler inspector. And that graduated into what we call a loss control inspector and risk management and it was my job to go and look at all of these different businesses and see how they were operating to help them mitigate their risks. And what I found was absolutely appalling. Most people, it was like their entire business was held together with bailing twine and duct tape. And it was really driven by the, the, the founder, the CEO, the business owner, just pushing as hard as they can to make sure everything got done. And that's what results in the vast majority of companies not scaling. You know, very few companies ever hit a million dollars in revenue. And I think it's it's like point point one five percent, give or take, out of all the companies that start that and then achieving eight figures in revenue. And when you think about that, you think about the millions of businesses that are started and the you know, six hundred and ninety five thousand or so that are started technically every single month, the vast majority of them never achieve any scale. And it's really because they haven't figured out how to systemize that growth. Right. I Yeah, I have like thinking in my head, like, there are like three different directions we can take this conversation. But the most juicy tangent <laughs> is uh, is the uh, your experience with the Navy and, and uh, operating the submarines. Could you talk a little bit more about what goes into operating a submarine? I, I'm, I'm imagining it's a super complex system with multiple checks and balances in place. Yeah, 100%. It is, you know, a multi-billion dollar war machine, um, to put it bluntly. And you're operating this thing with, I think the oldest person on a boat at any given time is under 40 years old, right? The captain is barely, if, if they're even 40, that's incredible. So you're talking about high schoolers, essentially, that get out of high school, go in the Navy, 18, 19 years old, operating these incredibly complex systems and machinery. Uh, we're talking warheads. We're talking a nuclear power plant that I, I was in the engine room. I was in charge of seawater systems and nuclear and primary uh, coolant systems. And I was eventually the quality assurance guy to make sure that everything was 
you know, tested and put together properly. And so there's a ton that goes into it. And I think it would really amaze a lot of people to find out the amount of training as well as documentation that the military has on practically everything. Like to give you an example, there is an operating procedure for how to flush a toilet, right? And, you know, that level of detail is absolutely vital if you're going to make sure that people don't mess up. And there's training that goes into all of this. And so if you're not training people properly and you don't have procedures for them to fall back on and, and read through and learn, then you're really struggling. And so, I mean, I could tell you story after story. And believe it or not, people operated the toilets incorrectly, even inside the Navy. And that caused a lot of problems for some people. But, you know, there's there's things like that where the military is very focused, especially um, on the nuclear side and definitely on the submarine side, because any mistake could cost people lives. And as a result, you're trying to avoid that at all costs. And you mitigate that and minimize that through proper training and proper procedures. Right. How many people are on board at a given time? Yeah, so I was on a what's called a fast attack submarine. I was a 688i class, the USS Jefferson City. And we would have anywhere from 130 to 160, 165 people on board. Oh, wow. I, I would have thought it would be less than 50. Like, is there like space in it? Uh, like... For sleeping quarters, like how many rooms are there for 165 yeah. people? Well, there's no rooms. I mean, I wouldn't call them rooms. Um, they're birthing areas. <laughs> and so we have bunks and they're stacked three high. And you have, you know, space is called 21 man, which means there's 21 bunks in that room or nine man. There's nine bunks in that room. And then there's the officer's quarters and all of that. The only people that have their own space really are the um, the executive officer, the, the cap, commanding officer captain. And then the high-ranking officers, there's maybe two, pe- two people per room. But everybody else is in these essentially dorm-style um, you know, barracks almost, if you will. But they're very, very tight and very confined, right? So the, the racks are stacked three tall. The bottom person is you know, barely six inches off the ground, and their rack, your, your rack opens up. And that's where you put your clothes and everything. So that's your, your entire dresser, if you will, or your wardrobe. And when you're junior on the boat, when I first got on, I had to do what's called hot racking, which means you have three guys rotating through two bunks. So you have to share your bunk and you're sharing your space. And of course, you're not sleeping in the same place at the same time, but you are rotating through. And not only that, but I was also sleeping next to a torpedo. So I would be rotating through and having to share my rack with other people and I'd have to sleep next to a torpedo. So anytime the torpedo men need to do any work, they'd have to kick us out so we wouldn't have a chance to sleep. And they do their work. So you make space wherever you possibly can. Every nook and cranny on a submarine is is you know really valuable real estate. And so you create lockers. And these lockers, um, you know, most people think of a locker as like a rectangular or a square box with a, a door on it. Ours would be any shape it could possibly be, just to you know fit it into a certain area, and then it would be bolted in or welded in um, at any weird shape, hexagons, octagons, you know half circles and you know all sorts of different sizes and shapes just so you could store stuff in and keep it safe we call it um, sea safe so it's stowed for sea um, you don't want things flying out all over the place so you know real estate is definitely at a premium on a submarine and that includes where you're sleeping yeah i'm trying to imagine if if in my head i'm trying to compare it to a cabin of of an airplane how, how big of an airplane should I imagine? Well, the submarine itself is the one that I was on 330 feet long. And half of that is an engine room. About 60 to 70% of that is other operating space. And you have the galley and the, the kitchen area. And then you have the birthing units. So <clears throat> it's hard to kind of imagine what it looks like unless you've been inside of one. And when you're going through... Um, you know, they're doorways, essentially waterways and whatnot. You're ducking down and standing up and going through these tiny little holes and pulling the doors closed behind you and, and all of that. And it's just, a as far as imagining it as an airplane, you know, I don't even know how long a 737 is, but I know the submarine is definitely longer than that. And the, the birth or the width of it is around 35, 40 feet, right? So you're talking about a 35, 40 foot diameter by 330 feet long. And a lot of that space is mostly working space. It's not where you're just sitting down and hanging out. And watching Apple TV (laughs) while (laughs) drinks are being served. (laughs) Yeah, no, if you're getting a drink served, you're pretty popular. (laughs) (laughs) 
So I'm I'm trying to imagine. So at a given moment, how many people are controlling or are in charge of navigating the submarine? Yeah. So roughly a third of the crew is on watch at any given time. So the way that a submarine works and operates is an 18 hour day. So instead of us having a 24 hour day, we have an 18 hour day and that's broken down into three, six hour shifts. So every six hours you're standing watch, which means you are manning a station. So let's just say I'm taking what we call uh, uh, the midnight watch. So midnight to 6 a.m. You're on watch and you're manning your space. You get off at 6 a.m., you go eat breakfast, and then you go do training or you go do drills or you do something like that. And so that next six hours from 6 a.m. to noon is when you're generally working. You might have maintenance to do. You might have training to get caught up on and so on. Then at around noon, you're able to finally go hit the rack, right? And if you're lucky, you get to sleep for a full six hours. It almost never happens. You're generally in the four-hour, give or take, camp of sleep. And then again, now you're waking up. So you're sleeping from, let's just say, noon to 6 p.m., and the next shift you get up, you get up at around 6 p.m., you eat dinner, and then you go back to the standing your shift. So you're literally rotating through, you know, these different meals and these different cycles every single day. But it doesn't really matter because you never see the sunshine anyway. So it doesn't really matter what time of day it is because the birthing areas are practically always dark and everything else is lit up. Um, the only thing that changes is the control room when you're, you know, on mission at night and you're up at the surface or you're at periscope depth, you have all the lights turned off. And that's when you see the scenes with the red lights in the control room, like whether it's K-19 or Hunt for Red October, it's all red. That's because at nighttime, you want to make sure that the lights are really, really dim and no one can see the light reflecting out of the periscope. Um, that's why they, they darken their control room. Uh -huh. So, but, but, but once again, the question was what I really wanted to ask was, how many people are in charge of navigating where the submarine is going? Right. So in the control room, you'll have a number of different watches. I, I can't remember the exact number, but it's somewhere in the neighborhood of uh, 10 to 12 watch standers right there in the control room. You have the dive, you have the chief of the watch, you have an officer who's in charge. You have one of my jobs was called geoplotting. So my job would be, you know, looking at one of the maps, you know, whenever I get a chance to do this and see where all the other ships were surrounding us and making sure that we're not navigating towards that. And then you have your entire sonar and control, your sonar room that's filled with all the sonar techs and they're listening and making sure we're not about to run into an underwater mountain or hit another ship or something like that. So in the control room alone, you might have 15 or so folks at any given time. Sometimes it can get a little bit more crowded and, and sometimes a lot less depending on you know, if you're on mission or if it's just a really, you know, easy day, and you're not actually tracking something or doing anything on a mission. I see. And you mentioned the, the bulk of the crew is very young, 18 or 19, and they're also sleep deprived. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's kind not of to scary, mention oxygen kind of deprived. When you think of it like that. Yeah, um, well, not to mention oxygen deprived. You actually keep the oxygen really low. So then in the event there's a fire, it doesn't spread quickly. So <laughs> oxygen's around, I think it's 18 to 19% oxygen. Uh, usually it's around 21%, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, in normal atmosphere, yep. Yeah. So I know you mentioned there's an operating procedure for everything, including how to use the toilet. And I would be curious to know how people don't do that correctly. But um, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, well, there, there are funny standards behind that, but I, that's maybe a story for another day. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, when someone's young and sleep-deprived and oxygen-deprived, I'm sure they're not always following the procedures correctly. So what other systems are in place to make sure that there aren't any accidents? Yeah, I mean, there's backups for the backups, right? So the first and foremost thing with the military, and I, I think this goes for practically any military unit, um, you know, the special forces even more so, which is you are training left, right, upside down, inside out. You are training nonstop. And we start calling it playing pretend. Right. Because you are, you know, grown men in these suits and you're you're wearing these suits and pretending like there's a steam line rupture. And if there's a steam line rupture, you know, essentially everybody can die in a matter of minutes. So you have to know how to do the procedure and follow the procedure to fix this problem without looking at a book. And you can imagine with all these systems in, in place, that requires a ton of training. So. Yes, sleep defri deprived, um, sometimes nutrient deficient because you, after you're underway for so many weeks, you don't have fresh food anymore. You know, everything's coming out of a box or a can. And you learn how to operate in those conditions. And it's amazing what the human body is capable of 
and the human mind is capable of. And so first and foremost, you start with all the training and you are drilled nonstop. And as you get higher in rank, it means you're responsible for the people underneath you, which means you don't need, only need to know your job. You need to know everybody else's job and you need to do this. And we have a thing called qualification. So if you see um, like on my book right there, the, the cover of it is what we call dolphins. And you earn your dolphins by qualifying and training and knowing a little bit about everybody's role and then a lot about yours. And your role changes throughout the course of your, your tenure on the boat because you, you rank up and you start sending different watches and whatnot. So that's like part A, right? It's just a massive amount of training that goes into it. You know, you don't just train on one thing one time and feel like you're good at it. You train on it a hundred times, then you go get a chance to pass a qualification board and then you get to train on it some more, right? So there's that. The second piece is that almost every system in a, a mechanical engineering type of system will have fail safes. So you will have a fail safe for, you know, the reactor, right? If it's running too hot or the pressure is getting too high, there'll be alarms and then there'll be eventual automatic shutdowns, right? So anytime something starts going wrong, if you don't notice it right away, there will be an alarm that will kick off. There will be lights flashing. There will be noises going. And then there will be everybody jumping on your case because you weren't paying attention. And then there will be, you know, getting in trouble for all of that. And if it still continues and nobody can fix it, there are automatic shutoffs for a lot of the systems to prevent things from, from going south. So it's backups to the backups. It's redundancies like you wouldn't believe. And, of course, a lot of training to make sure we don't have to use those. So I'm curious now how – I'm. A lot of, I think, what we'll get into is what entrepreneurs can learn from the military. Um, but if you're, and I can see how you can replicate this in a large corporation, but if you're a small entrepreneur just starting out, how do you... And we, you don't we're have transitioning. Any... I had a few more submarine, oh. juicy submarine <laughs> questions. <laughs> okay. Because I, I figured once we move on, then I can't, there's okay. no way I can transition back to this. <laughs> so a few questions I had was, how often are you just standing still as opposed to moving in a submarine? So you're almost never sitting still in the water. Um, you're, a submarine is generally, is not what we consider neutrally buoyant, right? It's a giant hunk of metal with a lot of really, really heavy stuff inside of it. And for it to be buoyant requires a massive amount of air inside of uh, the ballast tanks. Well, to counteract that, you are moving forward. And if you have forward motion, it's a lot easier for you know the stern planes and the bow planes. Essentially, think of it like a, an airplane. You're gliding through the water, and that um, negative pressure helps to keep you up, right? So that's why you're always moving. As soon as you stop moving, you need to make sure that you have plenty of air in there, and you are going to be neutrally buoyant. And if anybody's ever been a scuba diver, you know that if you have too much air in your BC, your buoyancy compensator device, you're going to start floating to the surface and bad things happen, right? So when you are underway, you are negatively buoyant, but you're using that forward moment, momentum to keep you going. Once you put enough air in, you don't have any option but to go to the surface. Now, there is a problem with that, which is if you put all of that air in and you put it in the wrong way, instead of you, you know, going up nice and easy and just kind of floating up in the right direction, you could end up like this. And if you end up like this in a submarine, that's really bad news because submarines don't go straight up like this. It'll, it'll sink straight to the bottom. Um, and there were a couple of boats that were actually lost as a result of those types of situations happening. So you're almost always moving forward. And we called it three knots to nowhere because you are, when you're on mission, you're patrolling a section of the ocean and nothing changes. It's all what we call steady state. Nothing is changing. The, the plants are operating, the turbines are spinning, the pumps are on. And it doesn't look like any of the needles are moving on any of the gauges, but you're just going along three to five knots at most and just kind of drifting through the ocean. I wouldn't say aimlessly because you're always looking for something. Something's going on out there, but you don't notice any changes inside the boat, right? It's like Groundhog Day. Everything is the exact same for sometimes weeks on end. Right. Does it ever happen where you encounter like an enemy submarine <laughs> or that only yeah. happens in a movie? In mostly the movies, um, you know, there's there certain things I'm not at liberty to say that we did, but, you know, part of your mission is monitoring other countries, right? That what we would call, quote unquote, the bad guys. Um, you know, I'm sure to them, we were the bad guys, but regardless, you are doing that stuff. And so we would actually have war games 
um, where we would try and catch, like we're with Australia, for example, or England, we would actually try to catch them and find them and, and play these war games to test if we could find them or vice versa, if they could find us. So for the most part, you're not necessarily going after other submarines, but you are tracking and monitoring other nations and seeing what they're doing. Uh, I see. But theoretically, that situation could happen where you're like oh. one-on-one with an enemy submarine and you have to like destroy them, otherwise you get destroyed kind of situation? I mean, in theory, uh, I'd say if that happened in this day and age, that we have a lot bigger problems than what the submarines <laughs> are doing. Um, but in theory, yeah, absolutely. Uh. How do you deal with boredom? Because it sounds like <laughs> you're well, just mentioning it's a lot of the... Yeah. But my understanding was there is no boredom because there's like always something to do. Is that oh, not you the still, case? You still get bored, right? So when you're standing watch, believe it or not, it's when you're technically standing watch that you are the most bored, right? Because nothing's changing. And when you're off, when you're not on watch, that's when you're doing training and you're doing drills and you're doing maintenance. Because a watch stander, um, yeah, think of it like uh, the, the guy, the guards at Buckingham Palace, right? When they're standing guard or the, the tomb of the unknown soldier, they are not allowed to do anything else besides that one job, right? And that's what standing watch is. You have one job and nothing is allowed to take your mind or your attention away from that. The only time that ever happens is if there's an emergency, right? But your one job is to stand watch, which means you're monitoring your space. And in the engine room, you'd have 10 to 15 people doing that. In the control room, you'd have about the same number, right? So that's your job. So when you're on watch, you're incredibly bored because a lot of things don't break. You know, a lot of things, uh, if, if everything goes properly anyway, and you're not allowed to read books, you're not allowed to watch TV, you're not allowed to have anything in the end room besides what's there for work. You're not doing any maintenance. You know, you might be studying because you're looking at the same manuals that you, know, you would normally need to look at anyway, but you get bored when you're standing watch. And we would say, you know, um, idle hands are the devil's playground, right? We'd say there's nothing, nothing worse than a bored nuke. Because you have really smart people that are really, really, really well trained, all of a sudden getting bored. And you really don't want that to happen. That's why they are constantly making you do something, right? Whether it's cleaning or sweeping or whatever it might be, um, because you don't want to have bored people. When you're not on watch, again, training, you can read a book when you're in your rack. They do have at night, almost every we call it burning a flick. You know, you're, you're watching a TV or a show almost every single night. Nowadays, I don't even know what it's like because they all have iPads and they have, you know, devices and whatnot. I was in when if you had a DVD player inside of your laptop, you were really lucky, right? So, um, you know, things have probably changed a little bit, but I'd imagine that the vast majority of them are still just doing their entertainment in their off time. Right. But you don't, you can't access, access internet, right? No. Um, they, they do have access to the internet and I imagine maybe, I don't know, maybe Starlink has gotten in with them now and they can do it better, but you still can't, you can't transmit um, satellite through the ocean, right? It just doesn't work. So the only time you can even transmit and receive is when you come up to the surface or periscope depth, you put the antennas up and then you can transmit. But even then you're talking really limited bandwidth. So as a result, you're not sending movies back and forth. You're not streaming anything. It's, you know, you're Netflix. sending text emails, things like that. Yeah, exactly. There's no Netflix underwater. <laughs> Here's a potentially dumb question. Are there any windows in a submarine? Nope, there are definitely no windows in a submarine. Um, <laughs> only the yellow submarine in Atlantis and Disneyland have those, but no, no windows whatsoever. Because you got to remember, you're going down hundreds and hundreds of feet, um, you know, and and windows tend to crack and break, and you definitely don't want that. And right, there's really right. nothing to see when you're that deep. There's no there's no light down there when you're really deep, so it's not like you're going to see anything anyway. But there's like, are there like active fish species in at that depth, or no? They oh, can't gosh, survive. Yeah. Oh, there is right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, there. You can go all the way down, and there, there's like the the fish that are bioluminescent mm -hmm. down in there. And they are at the seabed, or the sea floor. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you just gotta watch the make too, and they can show you all the things that are like the prehistoric animals, right? <laughs> but no, they as long as they're not breathing oxygen, right? Because oxygen compresses. So I was a diver as well, and it's when the oxygen compresses into your bloodstream that you start having problems: the oxygen and the nitrogen. And that's when you start having problems. Well, if you don't have oxygen or nitrogen because, you know, you're an amphibian, then water is not compressible. And so the further down you go, yes, there's more pressure, but you're equalized with the outside. So as long as your inside is equalized with the outside, you're good. Problem with humans is we breathe air, right? 
And since we breathe air, our bodies are filled with oxygen, not just in our lungs, but in our blood and everywhere. And so the deeper we go, if we're not protected from that, then we will implode. And that's not a good thing. Right. And what are the things that could go wrong, potentially, or, or like that do go wrong on a day-to-day basis? Well, things that do go wrong is anything you could imagine in, in a typical manufacturing facility, right? A, a pump bearing goes out, a valve isn't working, um, <clears throat> screws rattle loose, things like that. Electronics, you know, you bro- blow a breaker, blow a fuse. Those are the things that go wrong regularly, right? The things that could go wrong that are really, really scary Um, The three biggest fears of almost every Samariner is a um, a seawater leak, so flooding, a fire, and a steam line rupture. And flooding makes sense, right? If all of a sudden there's a hole in the side of the ship, there's nowhere to, like, bucket the water out, right? You can't pump the water out because you're underwater. So your systems are generally the place that you would end up with a a, a potential seawater leak. In that case, you need to make sure you solve that problem really quickly. Um, Fire, again, there's nowhere for the smoke to go. Right. And a lot of people don't really think about this, but when you're in in an area where there is nowhere for you to get that smoke out, if there is a fire, it just fills up instantly. And we're talking, you're, you'll die generally from the smoke inhalation before you will of the fire or the heat. So you've got to get the ship to the surface and get all that, that smoke out of there. And then the third one is a steam line rupture. And um, I can't remember, nor would I probably be allowed to say, but the size of a, a small crack in a steam pipe when you're talking hundreds of pounds of pressure and hundreds of degrees, that steam coming out, if you think of a tea kettle boiling, well, it's not hot enough to where you can't see the steam. But the steam that I'm talking about is so hot you can't even see the vapor, right? So it comes out and it will fill a space rather quickly. It'll pressurize it and, and increase the temperature by hundreds of degrees rather quickly. And so those are the biggest, the three biggest fears of most submariners. And you try to do everything you can to avoid those. Right. But in a water leak situation, is it like relatively easy to fix a smaller water leak? Or do you think it's like un, uh, close to a... Well, that, that really depends on, on the type of leak that you have, right? So if you have a tiny little hole in you know, one of the auxiliary systems and it's just like, you know, a pinhole leak, okay, no big deal. We isolate that, you fix that, right? or you bypass it altogether. And, and again, going back to the question earlier, there's redundancies for everything. So you can operate on half of a plant. There's two sides of a plant. You can operate on half of the plant. So you can shut down one entire side if you need to. On the other hand, if something major happens and a weld breaks that's attached to the hull of the boat, which you know that should never ever happen, but if it did, there's no fixing that, right? And that's a terrifying situation to be in. Uh, we actually did have that happen to one of, during one of our deployments is the weld actually cracked on a pipe going out of the boat and resulted in water coming in and all sorts of other nasty stuff too. Luckily, it was on the inside of a valve, so we were able to shut that valve off so the water could stop coming in. But if it was on the other side of that valve, we would have been SOL. That would have been a bad day. What does that stand for? Uh, straight out of luck. We'll just say straight out of luck. (laughs) (laughs) And in a fire situation or a smoke situation, how, how much time do you have to rise to the surface? Sometimes, um, it it depends on how bad it is. We actually had a fire happen a couple of times in the, uh, the dryer because, you know, that's a real thing. I don't, people in in the civilian world don't believe this sometimes, but that lint inside your dryer, if it doesn't get cleaned out, it can actually catch fire, right? So we had that happen a couple of times and you're talking smoke coming into the, um, the boat within, you know, 30 to 60 seconds. It's to the point where you almost can't see. So any much longer than that, and everybody has to don their emergency air breathing apparatuses. They need to put on their firefighting gear and go fight the fire and put it out. So you're trying to get to the surface within about two to three minutes tops. So you can start getting that, all of that smoke out. But within about 30 to 60 seconds, everybody's putting on their emergency gear so that they can still breathe. And how much of the redundancy is from the mechanical side, so built into the the boat already? And how much of it is systematic? So you have two different people, one person doing the job, one person QAing it, and so on. So in an emergency situation, first off, there's redundancies for everything on a mechanical, electrical systems, right? Every single thing has redundancy. 
Um, and they also all have safeties and backups and things like that. So you, you always have some level of redundancy and risk mitigation factors for those, which of course, that's kind of why I, I, I parlay that into business as well, right? Um, but secondarily, there's, there's multiple people trained for every single job. So if you think about, I was in the, the machinery division, I was a mechanic. And the first watch station that you qualify is what's called end room lower level. So it's the very bottom, it's the tail end of the boat. It's like, you know, all the way back, like a mushroom in the dark and just, you know, everybody ignores that, but that's the first watch station you learn. Well, when you learn that one, you get to stand watch and there's at least three people on any shift, right? Or any, um, underway because you have, you know, three, three different watch sections. So you at least have three. But then I might qualify end room forward, end room upper level, end room. Everybody, every qualification after that is still capable of doing the job of that end room lower level, right? So it's almost like when you hire somebody, we'll use an easy example, um, at a stadium, right? Well, maybe the very first job you get is you're the janitor sweeping and mopping the floors. And the, the best, the last job you might get is the person who's, you know, running the entire thing and responsible for all the employees there. Well, if you had to start at that sweeping the floors and you couldn't get to that top without going through every level, then, you know, that's kind of what we're referring to. Everybody, you have multiple people that can handle every single position. But how do you replicate something like that in a typical business environment where generally these days you're not, you know, you're not hiring someone from the janitor all the way up. You're yeah. hiring someone directly for a role so they haven't done all the roles beneath them. Yeah, that's a great question. The hope is that they have in their previous experiences, right? Well, yeah, I guess we'll let, let him answer. <laughs> well, you're right, though. That is that is the hope, um, and it's a challenge, right? It's a real challenge for a lot of business owners. And I, I've struggled that with that myself. My biggest challenge with managing people is that my expectations are way up here because of my training and my expertise and background. And most people who say they have this level of expertise don't, right? So it's managing expectations as part of it. But I, I, I do what's called moving the expertise upstream. On a submarine, the captain doesn't steer the ship, doesn't drive the ship, isn't responsible for any maintenance. They're not. The captain's job is to make sure that the mission is completed and they come home safely, right? That's the captain's job. It's the same thing for a CEO in a business, whether you're a startup or a multi-billion dollar uh, conglomerate. The CEO's job is to make sure the mission, the mission is fulfilled and that you're constantly moving forward. Well, how do you do that? You have to have the right seats filled by the right people at the right times. And you have to reinforce the standards and you have to make sure they have all the tools they need and the training they need to get that job done properly, whatever that job is for them. And so the expertise needs to be at the top, right? So again, rolling that expertise upstream, the, the CEO, the CEO of a boat, they need to be able to articulate what the mission is and then rely on the ranks underneath them to get the job done. Now, when you're an early stage entrepreneur, you're wearing all the hats, right? And you don't have much of an option around that unless you've been really well funded or you have a lot of credit cards that you just feel okay with putting a whole bunch of debt on there. You have to wear all the hats and you have to figure out which roles are the most important, most vital. And then you find your zone of genius, right? So again, my zone of genius is understanding that mission and the strategy to fulfill the mission. But if I'm spending my day every single day getting in and tweaking websites and fixing ads and then writing checks and doing all the accounting and the bookkeeping, then it's taking away from my time to focus on my zone of genius, which is the big picture strategy. And that's what a lot of business owners, entrepreneurs struggle with is they don't know what that zone of genius is for them. And so they can't fill the roles around them instead. Right. But I actually wanted to... It looks like we're moving towards entrepreneurship, but I wanted to add one more transitional (laughs) question, uh, just out of curiosity. Do you miss being on a submarine now that you have moved on to more corporate America lifestyle? Do you, do you ever miss your uh, you know the you excitement? Um, yeah, and I think this is true of almost any veteran. You, you don't necessarily miss the job all the time. I mean, there were definitely parts of it that are fun. But when you're in the military, and I can't speak for everybody, but I can speak for a lot of ranks in the military, you end up in a very high pressure, high stress situation with a with big stakes on the line, right? As as much as you know your own life or the lives of other people, and when you have that level of responsibility and the 
necessity to see the mission through and you succeed, everything else is almost child's play, right? And this is why we see a lot of veterans struggling with PTSD is that they had this sense of purpose while they were in because it was clear and present danger that they overcame with a cohort of other people, with their peers, right? And when you leave that, everything else seems really silly, right? And there's a movie, um, Hurt Locker. I don't know if you guys have seen it or not, but Jeremy Renner's the star in that. And this is the guy whose job it was, was to defuse bombs. And he knew at any moment, one false move or taking too long, and he's, you know, obliterated. And then he goes home and he has to go shopping, right? And he's standing there and he's looking at all the different choices of cereal, right? And this is a guy that was living out of a canteen and in the desert and had hardly any food or anything good um, a lot of the time. And he's just staring at an entire row of just every type of sugar laden cereal you could possibly imagine. And you can just imagine what's going through his mind. He's like, this is, this isn't so silly, right? I have to fight my way to get food half the time and, you know, barely had enough water to drink and, here it's just in abundance. And so that mindset is, is challenging to overcome. And going back to your question, that's the thing you end up missing, right? You miss the camaraderie. You miss the brotherhood. You miss being involved in high stakes, high pressure situations with a group of people that are incredibly competent at what they're doing and fulfilling a mission. And so do I miss being on the submarine? No. Uh, the smell of aiming in the air and the oil and the grease and all of that stuff. No, I don't miss that. With being getting three or four hours of sleep at night and getting woken up every hour of the night just to sign a piece of paper. I don't miss that at all. But I do miss the people I worked with. So I still they're still my best friends. We still hang out uh, from time to time. And I do miss having that camaraderie where you're fulfilling a mission together in a high stakes environment. I did also want to ask about the we're talking a little bit about uh, cultural differences, but specifically cultural differences between military and corporate America. What, where do you think corporate America could learn from the military, or how does how does it compare in terms of? Yeah, so well structure structure and systems are you know ingrained in both, right? Um, the, the problem, and I'm really surprised to see this because I've worked with a lot of really big companies, is that their systems are terrible most of the time, right? And the biggest problem with that, and I'm seeing it more and more, is that the people who are responsible for paying for the consultant or implementing the systems or buying the software aren't the same ones who are doing the job. And as a result, they're getting won over by salespeople from time to time or, you know, you know, sparkling objects, shiny objects, and they have great marketing and materials and like, oh, we should go buy that thing and use that. But then they don't use the system or the people who are doing the work aren't going to use the system because like the way I'm doing it already works better or I already know this one. And as a result, I'm going to do this. And so sometimes corporations will then force feed it down their, their people's throats and say, you have to do it this way. But in reality, since they've been so far removed from doing the job or have never done it in the first place, they don't understand that sometimes they're being doing more harm than good, right? So going back to the military, most of the time, I'm not going to say all the time, but most of the time, the people that are on top, at least in the enlisted side, um, had to go through all the ranks, right? They had to go through and do this thing. So at least there's some recollection of how it was on the officer side, because I was enlisted. I can't speak entirely to officers, but officers have to do the same thing, right? They don't become a captain the very first time they're there. They start off as a junior officer, then they're maybe a department head, and then maybe an executive officer, and then eventually they get to be a captain. So along the way, they're learning different skill sets. That doesn't mean they were in there getting their hands dirty and doing it, but at least they had to learn as they went up through the ranks. A big challenge with, I think, corporations is that you find, especially since there's so much like this revolving door policy with a lot of different companies, that you end up bringing people that have expertise maybe in an industry but they don't have an expertise in the operations of an existing company or things like that. And so as a result, you end up spending a lot of time on change management, on culture management, um, you know, having HR getting involved in everything because, well, things aren't working right. It must be a people problem. How do we fix our people? And a lot of the times it's really just the people who are doing the work feel like they're being left out from the people who are running the company. And the people who are running the company always think it's the people who are not doing the work, right? 
And so you always have this issue of going back and forth. It's like the bourgeoisie versus the proletariat, right? It's like we're always struggling against each other. Yeah, that sort of goes back to my earlier question of how do you create the same kind of tight systems you have in the military when you have in the business world a culture, a no longer, we don't really have a culture anymore of people rising up through the ranks and staying in a company for a while. So most people don't actually know if you're a manager, how the company's working. Yeah. What's the, what's the resolution or how do you solve for that? You know what it really comes down to if, um, you know, I think Simon's the next set of best to start with why, why are we doing what we do? Why did this business even start? And when I'm giving a speech and I'm going to be talking about buying businesses and building wealth, I actually start with why are we even here, right? It's not about buying businesses and building wealth. It's why are we even here? And it goes back to what you guys asked me in the very beginning. What's my mission? Well, my mission is freedom and autonomy. Right, so why are we even here? Well, it's because I want this. And words really matter, right? And people don't pay enough attention to the words that they say or the words that they use. And they're very flippant with onboarding somebody and explaining why a company works or why a company exists or what the culture is. And they don't pay enough attention to that. So I'll give you an example. You might hire somebody who is incredibly well-trained. They have all the accolades and all the degrees and all the certifications and they come in and they're going to work for a paycheck because they need the paycheck. They want the paycheck and you're willing to pay top rate for that versus somebody else who comes in and loves what the company is doing, but doesn't have all of that pedigree and all of that background. Which one do you think is going to work harder to make sure the job is done right? Right. It's the person who really aligns with the mission or the vision of the company. It's not the person who's necessarily the most skilled. And a lot of times, and I, where I think corporate America especially gets it wrong, is that, and, and entrepreneurs are terrible at this because they're just shaking whoever they can get, right? When they don't have any money, it's like, okay, whoever can fill this seat, please fill the seat because I need help. But corporations struggle because they don't figure out how to align the mission and the vision of the company with the mission and vision of the person. But when those things align, and you can see that there's a really good symbiotic relationship there. You are definitely going to see a lot more buy-in and motivation from the people. And that might mean that the people are boisterous and noisy about how to fix the systems. And you may not like that. But if they have the best interest of the company at, at heart, you should definitely listen to them. And so it's not really about technology. It's not even about systems or processes. It's really about culture, first and foremost. And that culture has to come from setting the vision right, and communicating that vision effectively. Yeah, no, it makes sense to me. I wanted to understand how did you transition from being in the Navy to starting a venture capital fund? Terribly. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that was actually a, um, a natural outgrowth of all the things I did for 12 to 13 years post-military. I, like I said, I worked in Fortune 500, I did risk management, and then I was running a, a technology division in a big company, and I was working with startups and entrepreneurs and all these technologists to uh, invest in, acquire, a partner with them, and then we'd scale them up. And that was a lot of fun. But after seeing these companies raise over a billion dollars and my paycheck didn't increase, I realized that I was not doing things the right way, right? So it was at that point, it was in 2018, where I decided to jump ship, and I went and um, took over a company called Angel Investors Network. And the whole point there was, let's show entrepreneurs how to do what I was doing in corporate America. Let's show them how to find investors. Let's show them how to create a pitch, you know, develop that use case. You know, all of these things are important for getting capital. And we did that for a little while. And I watched these companies raise money. And then I watched these companies fail, even after they raised the money. I said, well, this is kind of silly. <laughs> you know, and I didn't get any of the money they raised. So I was like, well, that's not really the greatest model. So, well, how do we fix that model? Well, how about we raise money and then we invest in the companies. And then when we invest in the companies, now we own a little piece of those companies. We get a little percentage of whatever we brought in from a management fee. And then we also consult, advise, coach, and direct these companies that we just invested in and how to grow and scale. And so that's how that ended up happening. Um, it was sort of this, this outgrowth of I'm not satisfied in my role right now. I'm doing all the work, but I'm not reaping the benefits. And, you know, again, going back to the freedom and autonomy, I seem to be working more and more for other people and helping them out, even though I'm not an employee, but it's not really what I want to do. 
And so that's how we shifted that model into um, raising capital for ourselves. And now we have, uh, we're working on a broker dealer platform for startups as well. You mentioned earlier that a pitiful number of businesses actually scale. What is it that everyone's doing wrong? Um, they're trying to be too many things to too many people instead of one thing to many people, right? Uh, I like to use the example of Google. What is it that Google did better than anybody else when they first came out? And a lot of people may not even remember this now, right? Because they are so many things to so many people. But they did one thing better than everybody else. And I, I'm curious what your guys' thoughts might be, what, what that one thing was. The You're the best, technology guy. <laughs> best search engine. Search engine, right? At the time, they would... Um, but what's it? Was it really the best search engine? Because it um, wasn't, right? It wasn't necessarily the best search engine. What it was was the simplest search engine, right? There were other platforms out there that could get you better results maybe, but they were the simplest and easiest to use. Now, all the stuff on the back end continued to grow and grow and grow, and they got better and better and better, right? But they were the simplest. And they were really one thing. We are search and we are simple search. Like you type your stuff in, you could even click the I'm feeling lucky button, right? If you remember that, and go right to that. But they made it incredibly simple. Whereas you had Alta Vista and Ask Jeeves and all these other ones. And like, it's just littered with stuff all over the page. And where do I go to find my thing? And the internet was still relatively new, right? So people struggled and they couldn't really adopt it. And there was this lack of adoption. Whereas Google was instantly adoptable, right? It was very, very simple. People said, that's what it is. That's what I want, right? You go back and you look at Ford Motor Company. You know, Henry Ford, famous for saying, people can have whatever color they want as long as it's black, right? We did one thing and we got really, really, really good at that one thing. Most companies try to venture off into too many things too fast. And I'm very guilty of that. I've Because I have a, a lot of background. So somebody asks you, when you're an entrepreneur and you get started, well, can you help me with this? Yeah, absolutely, I can help you with that. Can you help me with this? Yes, I can help you with that. And before you know it, you have the Chinese menu of a thousand things that you can do, but the outside world looks at you like, well, I don't know if you're the expert in this. I'm going to go look for the expert. And so the companies that can get really, really good at one thing, they have to be good at three very important areas of that one thing. One is selling it, right? And if you, as the founder, CEO, business owner, are the only one who can sell, you're never going to scale, right? You, you cannot be the only salesperson in your company. Uh, second is the marketing. If you're telling too many different things to too many people and there's no unique value proposition and there's no unique selling proposition, no one's going to get it. And if they don't get it, you don't have enough leads to sell them, right? So marketing is the other one. So marketing, sales, and the last one is operations. And how do you, and this is where the, the military mindset kind of comes in. How do you scale up operations, also known as service delivery, product delivery, things like that? The only way you can scale that up is if you do not have to hire experts for every little thing. You know, you look at McDonald's. McDonald's was not the best hamburger joint. Never has been. No one's ever claimed they, claimed they have the best burgers. But what did they have? They had the fastest, easiest process. It's, it's run by 16-year-olds all around the world. And yet somehow a Big Mac here is the same as a Big Mac where you guys are. And what did they have? They had a system. Because I said, okay, this is how a Big Mac is built. It doesn't matter if it's built in Milwaukee or Tampa or New York City or Los Angeles. Right? The Big Mac is built the exact same way. So your operations have to be repeatable and scalable. You can only do that when you're not selling a million things. If you're selling too many things, you're never going to be able to repeat it. So those are the three things I really focus on with entrepreneurs and business owners is how do we limit this? How do we minimize the stuff that we're offering? And that means you're going to ignore 99% of the market. And you have to be okay with that because you will not be able to scale until you can master those three areas of any business. That's so interesting. Couple... No, hold on, hold on, hold on. I... I was wondering if we can do like a specific example. What, Erica, you want to describe your company and get pick his brain on how we can apply those principles to your company? Sure, yeah. So, it's, I mean, it's a real estate company, so I'm guessing it, it's the advice will be applicable to all real estate companies, right? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, we have a, a company where we buy and sell vacant land. Um, it's a pretty simple model. Uh, we acquire properties off market and then we we market them either ourselves or with the realtor. Um, basic flipping. So how would we, so let's say 
we're we're just starting out. We're still a very small business. Mm -hmm. It's just me, let's say, working on it right now. How would I go about optimizing those three those three sections? Yeah, it's a great question, and, it's a, and it is a question that's applicable to every startup, mm -hmm. which is you have what we call the curse of knowledge, right? You already know what to do almost every single day without even looking at a procedure, without ever having to you know, figure out what the next step is. And then let's just say you're using direct mail and you're going on to a site like Property Radar and you're finding the vacant lot owners and then you get their name, their phone number, their email, their mailing address, whatever it is. And you know, okay, I'm going to send out a postcard this day. And if I don't hear back from them next week, I'm going to send a letter. Then two weeks later, I'm going to send a handwritten letter. Then another time I'm going to do a postcard. And if I still don't hear back from them, every month I'm going to do a postcard. And this is what I'm going to say on this one. This is what I'm going to say on that one, right? You understand the lead generation process, right? Then you know when somebody picks up the phone and calls me, okay, here's what I say. And you may not even have a script written down and you're going to go sort of loosey-goosey with the, the, the call, but you know how you want to steer the call and you know what the unique selling proposition is and you know what you're going to say to convince them to sell their property. And then you know if I do this, okay, now I've got to get it under contract or I've got to get an option on it. I've got to do this. So that means i got to get this paper, that, right? There's all these steps and there's maybe a thousand steps, but because you've done it so many times, it's natural to you. So the biggest challenge is if you say, hey, I want to hand off maybe the lead generation process to somebody. Could you do that today without them coming to you and asking for your help every single step of the way? Or would it take them a long time of sitting beside you watching, learning and still fumbling along the way? And that's what I would say is the most important thing for any entrepreneur that's looking to scale. It's kind of like the e-myth, right? You have to start documenting. I don't care about, like Michael Gerber talks about documenting the roles and responsibilities. Generally, that's premature because roles and responsibilities indicate that you have a, enough money coming in to hire people for a very specific role. On the other hand, it's figure out what the process is. And you outline that process. It's called value stream mapping. In the manufacturing world, they talk about, if you read a book called The Goal by um, um, Eliyahu Goldratt, uh, he talks about this in a really great way. But if you think about going from a, a fuselage arrives at the Boeing facility to an, a finished airplane at the very end, there's a lot of steps in between, right? And those steps all have to be done in a sequence. And that's called a value stream or a value map. Um, and you need to map that out. What, is every, what does it look like from start to finish? And you put that up on, a, you know, you use a charting software, you put it up on butcher paper around the room, whatever you need to. Once you have identified what the steps are and the stages are in that process, then you need to say, okay, well, in this step, these are the 20 different things that need to happen in this one area, right? And that might be getting the list, right? So how do I get the list? I go here, I go here, I go here, I download it, right? And so you actually start documenting that. And what I like to do, um, there's a, a program out there called Tango, and Tango allows you to monitor your clicks and know what the website is. So you can actually build a procedure just by clicking around on the, the internet. But you have to take that and you have to turn that into at least a document, preferably a document and a video, and then eventually a document, a video, and a project management system, right? And in the project, we use ClickUp, for example, project management system, you can create a template, you press go, and the new task comes out. And you have to do that for every single step. And it takes a long time and entrepreneurs hate doing it. Why is that? Because most entrepreneurs are very visionary, they do not want to be in the weeds doing this sort of stuff. And so we, and this is why Gina Wickman talks about having the, the visionary and the integrator. And the integrator is like your chief operations officer. It's your project manager. It's your president. It's someone like that that loves getting in the weeds of that stuff. Because if you don't love doing that, don't bother. Because you'll get halfway through. It'll take you away from your zone of genius again. And you won't get it very far. On the other hand, if you can get in the room, start doing meetings with somebody, and that's the way I like to do it. I get on the meeting with my project manager, and she has a million questions. And it makes me pull my hair out every time because I'm like, I don't understand why you don't know this, right? But it's not her job to know it. It's my job. I know the stuff. But she then needs to take that and turn that into bite-sized chunks. And then we have to test it. We have to battle test it. Okay, now that we've done this, hand it off to the next person who's going to replace me in this role. And if they can't figure it out, it means I did not do a good enough job of explaining it. But that's how you scale, right? That's how an 18-year-old can run a nuclear power plant. 
because there's a step-by-step -step procedure. There's a procedure for the procedure for the procedure, right? And you have to be able to follow the cookie crumbs to get there. And so you have to do the painstaking process of getting somebody there who is going to listen to you and then document that process along the way so that you can eventually turn that into a system you can hand off to somebody else. And it could just be as simple as a checklist, right? On a Google Sheet or even a Google Doc. It doesn't matter. Um, but that's how you start. And then once you've done that, now you have you know, what we would call an operating system. And you can plug and play people into different roles in that operating system. And you can even take that operating system, you can move it from California to New Mexico to Arizona to, to Utah to all the way to New York City if you want to, maybe even overseas, right? But it all starts with knowing what that process is. And most people are terrible about it um, because they just inherently know it, but they forget to replace themselves. And I would say for anybody, yourself included, if you want to scale your business, your number one job is to figure out how to play, replace yourself in every role as quickly as possible. Well, if she replaces every possible role, then why do we need Erica? <laughs> That's a great question. You don't, right? She gets to be the chairman or chairwoman. Why wouldn't you rather be a business owner instead of the operator? Right. So her job would be just to, as as the captain of, of a submarine, just to make sure everything is running Bingo. smoothly? Bingo. Yeah. Like, you know, the, the captain of the submarine makes sure the, the boat's moving, but the commodore, the squadron commander, doesn't even make sure the boat's running smoothly. He just makes sure the boats go out and boats come back, right? So you have all these different levels. The, the chief naval officer, the person in charge of the entire Navy, doesn't even make sure the boats go out and come back. The chief naval officer makes sure the Navy's operating in a big way, and they don't even operate any equipment, right? So my goal with myself, my clients, is to get you into that chair chairperson role. When you are the chairperson... You are the owner. I would much rather be an owner, right? Going back to like Robert Kiyosaki's cash flow quadrant, you go employee to self-employed to business owner. And most people miss this. When you're the business owner, you're not the business operator. And, and he had a story and I got a chance to talk with him about this, but he finally realized when he made it because he could leave and be gone for two weeks or three weeks or two months. And the business was operating better when he came back than it was when he left. That's when you know you've succeeded. Because if it's operating terribly whenever you leave or it closes up shop every time you want to take a vacation, you don't have a business. You're self-employed. Right. Yeah, yeah, we talked about scaling. It makes sense. But how do we raise capital? Oh, man. How do we raise capital? <laughs> well, how much longer do we have here? <laughs> a few minutes. <laughs> it's the same thing as marketing, right? Um, whenever you're raising capital, you are selling. And you need to realize that you are selling yourself, you're selling a vision, you're selling a product, you are selling. And so to raise capital, it's the same thing as anything else marketing related. It's the right message to the right market using the right media. In other words, if I go and I pitch a thousand people and I'm trying to raise a million dollars for whatever it is, let's say I know whatever the thing, inside out, backwards, upside down and everything. And I can pitch it in the dark without any slides and, you know, do it from memory, even in my sleep. That's great. But if I go pitch a thousand people that don't have a dollar to their name, am I going to succeed? No, of course not. On the other hand, if I go give a terrible pitch and I don't have a business plan, I can't remember it, I'm fumbling over my words, and I go talk to a thousand billionaires, am I going to raise capital? Probably not, right? Unless they're willing to spend a lot of time, and trust me, they are not. Um... If I have the best pitch and I have the best list, but I never get in front of them, am I going to raise capital? No, I'm not. So it really comes down to know what you're raising capital for. Know the pitch inside out. Know your business inside out. Be, to, be so good that they cannot ever question your authority on the topic. Then go after only the people that are qualified. Right? This is where a lot of marketing dollars are wasted. People are just shotgun marketing all over the place. And they're hoping that the right people are going to eventually show up or show up in their funnel and do this. And they're not being very targeted. So go after only the people. And if that's 100 people or if that's even just 10 people, you start with them. And you do everything you can to get on their radar and talk to them and follow up with them and so on. Right. And then eventually you refine your presentation. You answer all the questions and you have to really be listening. Because when you start, when you start raising capital, people are going to have a million questions. And if you are not keeping track of what those questions are and writing an answer for that and have that into your next pitch or your PPM or your subscription agreement or whatever, your term sheet, then 
you're going to keep answering that question. So it goes back to systems and processes, right? What's the feedback loop? Somebody asked me a question. Oh, that's a really good question. We should clarify that so that our next presentation, they don't have that question. And if somebody just says, no, it's not for me, you need to ask why. Why is it not for you? Is it because you don't have the money right now? Is it because it's not the right industry? Is it because you have questions about the business model? Like you need to get that, that clarity. So then you can go refine and fix it. And so right. as far as how to raise capital, there's a million different pieces to it. But that's the big piece. That's the big part of it. I had one question. Well, it relates to both raising capital, but marketing in general. You mentioned one of the three legs of the three-legged stool is, is marketing and having a product that is unique or better than anything else. Uh, let's go back to the example of our business. So we're, you know, we're, we're selling land. Mm -hmm. There's, it's not a unique product that we've created. How do we differentiate ourselves when we're, we're selling, you know, a product that. Like a cookie cutter yeah, property. That a, a lot yeah. of other people are selling. Well, for starters, you go after the people who are not already being sold to, right? Um, if you can find the right audience and they've never heard of this, like here's one of the cool things about my business. I get to see startups every day, literally every single day. I'm talking with a new startup or getting a pitch deck or whatever. And because I've been doing this for so long, I see some really unique things. I see some things that I think people are just pulling magic out of thin air and hoping that it's going to work and they're just puffing themselves up. But then I see stuff that actually works. And I was having a trouble a while back of, well, how do I scale this company so that I get more investors coming in? Because, you know, I see this stuff all the time. Why would people spend, spend money to come to these events or, you know, to be part of this, right? Because they already have all the money they need. They don't need more money. They don't need to invest at all. I'm in a room full of, you know, seven, eight figure earners. And I'm talking on stage with these folks. I'm kind of doing a hot seat. And I asked uh, Perry, I said, you know, this is my problem. I'm running into this issue. I don't think that people are willing to pay for coming to see deals. And he does a poll in the room. He goes, how many, how many of you guys in here get to see deals every single day like he does? One person's hand at a room of 200 went up, right? And that was the cue for me. It's like, oh, this is the audience you need to be going after. These people are wealthy. They have money, but they don't see what I see. They don't get access to it. Because they don't get access to it, all I have to do is make it really appealing for them to want to be part of this. And so we did that. So going back to your situation, it's like, okay, yeah, there's a lot of raw land out there. And there's a lot of people that are probably trying to do the same thing you're doing. But are you able to do it in a way where you're showing up where no one else is showing up? Right? You are, are you talking to the right people that have never heard about this opportunity before? Are there plenty of wealthy people that would love to just be able to get involved with what you're doing and be completely hands off? Like what's the value proposition for them? And are you showing up without any competition? That's what we want to do. We want to operate in a vacuum as much as we possibly can. And so there's probably a group of subgroup, subset of uh, people out there that have never, never heard of this, have never been approached with this opportunity, but they're still a great fit and they could do it. They just might need to hear it said a different way. They might need to see you show up at a different place. Like if it's doctors, guess what? The only time doctors ever look at practically anything is when they're in a conference in a room full of other doctors, right? They are too busy with their own thing. And as soon as they're done in the hospital or the office, they are checked out, right? But man, you take them to an industry conference and they're all talking shop about this. And, da, 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 da. and at the country club, they're talking all this stuff. And all of a sudden, these opportunities show up and they're like, oh, I should go check that out because, you know, Joe over here, check that out. I don't want to be left out. I'll go and see what he's doing. Right. And so it's showing up in the right place at the right time. Um, the fourth piece of that, that stool, if you will, the marketing triangle, you have message market media match. And then right in the middle is the moment, right? When's the right moment for these people to see it? And since you don't know what that is, you got to show up all the time. Right? How do you find these, yeah, these groups of mine. people right. who have yeah. never seen your product, but want it? Well, yeah, I guess, yeah, we can ask that first, but I have a similar question, but uh, go ahead. So to answer that, I'll give you another example. Um, a, a gentleman, uh, and the, my mentor told me this story. It was, this guy was selling gold chains and gold watches and gold by the inch. And now it's a, a major thing. But when they were getting started, they couldn't figure out how to sell. They were going to all these different jewelry shows or all these investor shows. And they're trying to sell gold. And they're in the, the conference hall with all these other jewelers and people that are just selling stuff. And he tried setting up kiosks in the mall and all this. And nothing was working. And they said, well, why don't you go where all the money is, 
but people like you trying to sell to those people with money aren't. And so they started going to horse shows. And guess what? There's not a lot of jewelers at horse shows. Started going to car shows. Not a lot of jewelers at car shows. And so the psychology there was this person who's about to go buy a horse and spend tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars on a horse who swore to their wife, I promise I'm not going to buy another horse, all of a sudden sees this guy right there selling twenty, thirty thousand dollar rings and he's the only one only game in town. Well, if I buy her a ring right here, you know, or I buy her a necklace or I buy her a bracelet, maybe she'll forgive me for taking the horse home too, right? And so it was positioning, it's a, it was a place strategy. And so to do all this, you first have to know your market. You have to know who your ideal client is, right? Filling out that buyer persona and understanding your avatar. And then you figure out where they're going, right? Are they showing up on Facebook groups? Are they going to trade shows? Are they, you know, are they vacationing in certain areas? Are they flying private jets? Another guy uh, that I know, he would only do wealth management for really, really wealthy people, $10 million net worth and beyond. And so the only place he would advertise is on private jets. So there's specific magazines that go in the backs of private jets and that's the only place he would advertise. And he got more, more than enough business. So it's really figuring out who your ideal avatar is first. And sometimes that does require a shotgun approach because you may not know. You may not know who it is, but if you have an idea, then you can use that. And I would suggest honestly going to chat GPT and saying, this is what I do. And here's the minimum requirement for somebody to work with me. Who do you think this is? Give me an idea and then ask it, where do you think I should find those people? Like AI is getting incredibly powerful. And we, a lot of people are still barely scratching the surface, but that's a great use case for something like chat GPT. Yeah. Um, I had a similar question, but on the raising capital side, like, can you give some actionable tips? Like what would be some of the first steps a small entrepreneur can take? Like uh, in my head, I'm imagining reaching out to uh, venture capital groups like yours on LinkedIn. Is that, am, am I thinking in the correct That's line? the very first step they're going to take? No. Um, the very first place you start is friends and family, right? That's why we call it the friends and family. Right? Actually, we call it the friends, family, and fools round because sometimes you're, you, you might get money from somebody that doesn't know you from Adam, but they're willing to just, you know, gamble with you. So if you are just getting started in raising capital and you've never done it before, the very first thing you do is you start going to angel groups and you watch other people pitch. You start going to demo days. You start watching Shark Tank. If you're not watching Shark Tank or The Profit or West Texas Investor Club religiously, then you're missing out. Um, you got to watch all that stuff because there's questions that entrepreneurs don't answer that need they need to. There's ways to pitch your product and your idea that are better than others. And you've got to start gathering that repertoire of information. Um, from there you need to have a really clear and concise and compelling reason for somebody to want to invest with you. And most entrepreneurs, I mean, we, we kind of laugh about it and shake our heads. They all think their valuation is going to be a billion dollars in three years. Everybody does, right? And I've even been told by certain people they're going to have a trillion dollars in five years. That is just like such pie in the sky that even if it could possibly be true, People just throw it out right away. Like this person isn't for real. They're a charlatan. I don't believe them. Everything they said after that is I'm ignoring it. If I'm even letting you continue the conversation. So you need to instead, like you don't say, okay, we're going to be a billion dollar company. You say, you know, we're raising a hundred thousand dollars and that'll get us 12 more months of runway that allow us to get to this benchmark, which will allow our valuation to go up to this and so on. So you break it down to bite-sized chunks and you would start with your friends and family. And you start with the ones who are going to be brutally honest with you. And it sucks to hear that your baby's ugly, but sometimes you need to. And sometimes your friends are the best ones to do that. A lot of great advice here. I, I think we both have a ton of other questions. So maybe we'll need to do part two at some point. But uh, I'm sure anyone watching probably has additional questions. Um, if they wanted to learn more about you and what you do or, or they're, raise looking, capital. Yeah, they're looking for funding, <laughs> how, how can they get in touch with you? Yeah, best place to go is jeffbarnes.ceo, and that's where you get links to everything else that I do, whether it's our marketing agency, raising capital, helping with uh, you know celebrities and branding and all of that. That's, that's the best place is jeffbarnes.ceo, and that also has links to all my socials as well. All right. Good. Well, thank you so much. Yeah, we appreciate you. 
Thank you. I appreciate it, folks.